Uh, Would you please turn to the book of Exodus? Now you'll see printed uh, chapters 35 to 40. Don't worry, we're not going to read a full five chapters right now. Uh, But the sermon will be based on five chapters. But what we'll do is we're just going to read chapter 35 verses uh, 1 to 29 now. And then before the sermon, we'll read another little bit from this section. And we're getting to the culmination of uh, the book of Exodus. We've had all the tabernacle described earlier. And we've had the golden calf, God revealing his glory. And a new covenant, or the covenant renewed. And then here we get to chapter 35. Let's listen to God's words. Moses assembled all the congregation of the people of Israel and said to them, these are the things that the Lord has commanded you to do. Six days work shall be done, but on the seventh day you shall have a Sabbath of solemn rest, holy to the Lord. Whoever does any work on it shall be put to death. You shall kindle no fire in all your dwelling places on the Sabbath day. Moses said to all the congregation of the people of Israel, This is the thing that the Lord has commanded. Take from among you a contribution to the Lord. Whoever is of a generous heart, let him bring the Lord's contribution, gold, silver, and bronze, blue and purple and scarlet yarns and fine twined linen, goat's hair, tanned ramskins and goatskins, acacia wood, oil for the light, spices for the anointing oil, and for the fragrant incense, and onyx stones, and stones for setting, for the ephod, and for the breastpiece. Let every skillful craftsman among you come and make all that the Lord has commanded, the tabernacle, its tent, and its covering, its hooks, and its frames, its bars, its pillars, and its bases, the ark with its poles, the mercy seat, and the veil of the screen, the table with its poles, and all its utensils, and the bread of the presence, the lampstand also for the light with its utensils and its lamps and the oil for the light and the altar of incense with its poles and the anointing oil and the fragrant incense and the screen for the door at the door of the tabernacle, the altar of burnt offering with its grating of bronze, its poles and its, all its utensils, the basin and its stand, the hangings of the court, its pillars and its bases and the screen for the gate of the court. The pegs of the tabernacle and the pegs of the court and their cords, the finely worked garments for ministering in the holy place, the holy garments for Aaron the priest and the garments of his sons for their service as priests. Then all the congregation of the people of Israel departed from the presence of Moses and they came, everyone whose heart stirred him and everyone whose spirit moved him and brought the Lord's contribution to be used for the tent of meeting and for all its service and for the holy garments. So they came, both men and women, all who were of a willing heart brought brooches and earrings and signet rings and armlets, all sorts of gold objects, every man dedicating an offering of God to the Lord. And every one who possessed blue or purple or scarlet yarns or fine linen or goat's hair or tanned ram skins or goat skins brought them. Everyone who could make a contribution of silver or bronze brought it as the Lord's contribution. And every one who possessed acacia wood of any use in the work brought it. And every skillful woman spun with her hands, and they all brought what they had spun in blue and purple and scarlet yarns and fine twine linen. All the women whose hearts stirred them to use their skills spun the goat's hair, and the leaders brought onyx stones and stones to be set for the ephod and for the breastpiece, and the spices and oil for the light and for the anointing oil and for the fragrant incense. All the men and women, the people of Israel, whose heart moved them to bring anything for the work that the Lord had commanded by Moses to be done, brought it as a free will offering to the Lord. So as we read, Moses is instructing about the tabernacle. We've had all the instructions previously about it. Now they're collecting all the stuff in. Then uh, 35 verse 30, we get the man who's going to be organizing this. Uh, If you look at verse 30, Bezalel, the son of Uri, son of Hur, of the tribe of Judah, filled with the Spirit of God, with skill, with intelligence. So he, he kind of runs... Uh, this building um, of the tabernacle. And then over the next few chapters, if you scan your eyes over it, you can see detailed uh, description of it all being built. It's very similar to the words that came before the the, uh, golden calf incident. 
Um, so it goes through, then we've got the ark, the making of the table, the lampstand, the altar of innocence. Chapter 38, we get the uh, making of the um, altar and the bronze basin and the court, uh, the materials uh, for the tabernacle. Chapter 39, we get the priestly uh, garments. And then let me just read the end of chapter 39, and then we'll read the end of uh, chapter 40 as well. But the end of chapter 39, from verse 32. Thus, all the work of the tabernacle of the tent of meeting was finished. And the people of Israel did according to all that the Lord had commanded Moses, so they did. Then they brought the tabernacle to Moses, the tent and all its utensils, its hooks, its frames, its bars, its pillars and its bases, the covering of tan ram skins and goat skins and the veil of the screen, the ark of the testimony with its poles and the mercy seat, the table with all its utensils and the bread of presence, the lampstand of pure gold and its lamps with the lamp set and all its utensils and the oil for the light, the golden altar, the anointing oil, the fragrant incense and the screen for the entrance of the tent, the bronze altar and its grating of bronze, its poles and all its utensils, the basin and its stands, the hangings of the court, its pillars and its bases and the screen of the gate of the court, its cords and its pegs and all the utensils for the service of the tabernacle, for the tent of meeting. The finely worked garments for ministering in the holy place, the holy garments for Aaron the priest and the garments of his sons for the service of priests. According to all that the Lord had commanded Moses, so the people of Israel had done all the work. And Moses saw all the work, and behold, they had done it. As the Lord had commanded, so had they done it. Then Moses blessed them. Then in chapter 40, we get the actual construction of it, the anointing of it. And then finally, let's read just the end of chapter 40. From verse 34. Then the cloud covered the tent of meeting, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. And Moses was not able to enter the tent of meeting because the cloud settled on it, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Throughout all their journeys, whenever the cloud was taken up from, the tabernacle, from over the tabernacle, the people of Israel would set out. But if the cloud was not taken up, then they did not set out till the day that it was taken up. For the cloud of the Lord was on the tabernacle by day, and fire was in it by night, in the sight of all the house of Israel throughout all their journeys. Amen. Now, as many of you know, uh, we're in the midst of a building project. Uh, it's been going on for many years. It's taken massive investment of time, money, resources, and people. Many of you have prayed for it. You've been involved in it. You've given to it. It's been hard at times, perhaps slow, yet encouraging. David has a few more gray hairs because of it. And the thing is, I'm not actually talking about Queen Street. I'm not talking about actual bricks and mortar, slate roofs, pews, granite. I'm talking about a project on a far, far bigger scale. One that's been going on for thousands of years. One that has included millions and millions and millions of people. The greatest building project of all time. I'm talking about God's great building project. God is building his house, a house for, for himself. It's not made of stones, but of people people of different shapes and sizes, ages and character, living stones. That's what we are right here, right now, a small section of God's great house, his home. And tonight, we're going to see that God is the great builder. And even though he's the great builder, he's also employing apprentices. We're his building apprentices. He's training us to be builders like him. Here's what we're going to see from Exodus this evening. God's building his home, and he's getting us involved. But why do I say it's all about people? Surely it's pretty plain from this passage. It's about a physical man-made tabernacle. It's about gold and silver and yarn and goat skins and bronze and wood, not people. We read it 
uh, just earlier, back in chapter 35, whoever is of generous heart, let him bring the Lord's contribution, gold and silver and bronze, blue and purple and scarlet yarns, and it goes on and on and on. Should that have been our offering this evening? You know, should I have been asking you guys for some more wool and some bronze uh, to put into the bag? Well, first, we just need to take a short ride through the Bible to see, first of all, God's home is the church. I want to just show you that. God's home is the church, and then we'll get on to building it. Now, we, we have thought about this a few times over the past few months, because Exodus, as, as I said earlier, has already spelled out everything uh, to do with this tabernacle. If you remember chapters 25 to 31, there are all the instructions for it. Uh, so the king, God himself, was coming to live, and like his people, he needs a home. And here in Exodus, it's a tent, and it's a beautiful tent. Just try and picture it. There were the beautiful, huge curtains of different colors with the ark, a table intricately carved out of wood, the gold overlaying it, the shining bronze altar. Here is a place on earth for the God of heaven to be present in. All of the world is his, and yet he's got his people to build a specific place for his glory to be manifest, a place amongst his people. And this is all part of a trajectory that started back at the beginning of the Bible. God has always sought to be in the midst of his people. It's always been about people. As Struan brought out for us a few weeks ago, the tabernacle reflects Eden. If you remember that the holy of holies, like a garden, angels keeping humans from that garden, like in Genesis 3, a candlestick like a tree, courtyards representing creation in the heavens, a priest to work and tend the garden. Eden was God's first house. And like the tabernacle, God was in the midst of the garden. He had his home amongst his people. He walked with Adam and Eve, and he, he, he planned that as the human population grew, so the garden would grow. God always with his people. But we know the story. It all goes wrong. A sin enters the earth. Humans are banished. But God's plan to live with his people goes on, because in Exodus, we, we see the home then in shadow form, don't we? It's still all about the people. God comes to dwell amongst them but it's in a tent. He's separate and yet close. And there's a lot of symbolism in it all that we've thought about. They're to teach us people like the ark and the the candlestick, pointing us to deeper realities, but it's all in shadowy form. And so as the Bible goes on, we know it all comes to fulfillment in Jesus Christ. As he steps along the streets of Jerusalem, we see truly the desire for God to be at home with his people. Firstly, God himself becomes fully man. No longer is he in the form of an inapproachable glory cloud. Now God has come as a human being. And and John says in his gospel, the word took on flesh and dwelt among us. That word for dwelt, it's literally he pitched his tent among us. He tabernacled. Here he didn't have goat skins and yarn, and there's no gold and silver, there's no box, but something far more fitting, a human body. The Son took on flesh and dwelt among us. This this was it as it was meant to be, God and man truly together. Here is God's home. And more than that, Jesus is truly amongst his people. God has dwelt amongst us. God has dwelt amongst us. He's walked the streets of Jerusalem. God ate fish and slept by the Sea of Galilee. But then Jesus takes it to the next level. Because by his spirit, he begins to make a home for God that is in a sense an extension of him. It's the body of Christ, the church. God doesn't just walk next to people. He comes and lives with them, in them. I know we've probably heard that, we know that, but it is mental. God himself coming to live in people. He sends his spirit to us. He lives with the church. Rather than in a tent, God by his son and spirit comes to live amongst his people. God's building his home and his home is the church. The apostle Peter says, you yourselves like living stones are being built up as a spiritual house. 
The Apostle Paul puts it like this, in Christ you are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. This tabernacle made of wood and metal in Exodus 39, it's only a shadow, a pointer to the greater temple. Jesus Christ is building a spiritual house, a house of people, his church, a building project that's gonna be completed in the new creation when every stone will be in place every, from every tribe and tongue and nation, specially chosen to be with God, worshiping around the throne. What's God's building? He's building a home and it's the church. It's amazing. There is a grand building project going on in our world. It's been going on for years. Can you hear it? There's a chip, chipping away of stones, the clanging of steel, A great house is being put together. Right now, there are 2.5 billion professing Christians in our world. There must be millions and millions of local churches meeting today. And that's just in 2024. Think of the last 2,000 years as the gospel has spread. What a project that is. And that even includes little old us up here in Aberdeen. God's building his home and it's the church. But Exodus 35 to 40 brings out something more. God's building his home, yes, but he's getting us involved. He's getting us involved. And this is a a surprise. Just think about the whole story of Exodus. God has done all the hard lifting, hasn't he? Back in Egypt, it was all going very badly until he showed up. He picked a leader in Moses. He smashed the power of the enemy in the plagues and the Red Sea. He set his people free through the blood of a lamb. He looked after them with no food or water. He graced them with his law. He sealed them as his treasure possession with his covenant. He stuck with them even through idolatry and sin. Here is God the great builder. He's been getting everything in place. He's been saving his whole nation. But here's the surprise. When it comes to the tabernacle, It doesn't just drop from heaven fully made. It's not like manna, just appearing there in the morning. No, God gets his people to build it. That's what chapters 35 to 40 are about. First in chapter 35, they give all their stuff, their gold and silver and yarns, their goatskins and oils and spices and precious stones. And then over the next few chapters, they make it. They weave, they carve, they build. God's building his home and he's getting his people involved in it. Just imagine uh, the Israelite tent city as Moses says the tabernacle project is still on. God's still coming with us. The second Moses gives the green light, there must have been such a buzz of excitement. People just rushing back to their tents to find what they can give. Parents wondering how much to give. You know, we can, we can give those skins and, and that gold. I've got more yarn out back. I think Gran's got some too. And, then, and they bring more and more, so much, actually, Moses has to tell them to stop. And then the work begins. The noise that must have filled that camp. The banging as the metals were shaped the soaring of wood, the scritch scratch of needles sewing. There was a hive of activity. Here was the, the wonderful, fulfilling world of people building God's house. God gets people, even us, involved in his building project. But rather than creating curtains and poles and articles for worship, God's got us building people, building up and building out, up and out, building up, Well, that's discipleship, isn't it? That's the strengthening of those who are already in the building. It's repointing the cement. It's smoothing the stones. It's fashioning them to look beautiful and sit together perfectly. It's God's people looking more and more like Jesus, holy, united, building up, but also building out. It's evangelism. It's about extending the home. It's about reaching more and more people with the good news of Christ, bringing them into the building, welcoming them to be part of the home. It's building up and building out. This is what God is apprenticing us in. He wants a beautiful home for us to live in. He wants us to be involved. What a privilege we have. We're to be people focused on people. And we're actually more involved than we realize. Just think of all the people you've met over the past few weeks. 
people to build up or to build out to. Your friends, your work colleagues, your children, your spouse, your church family here tonight, your neighbors, your flatmates, your shop workers, your extended family, so many people. And yet, I think it's amazing how quickly we forget and we become project focused, not people focused. Because I don't know about you, but if I'm not kind of in church or in the zone, I can weirdly ignore a person while interacting with them. A bit gruff with the person at the shop, ignoring my children's worries as I get them, get them out to school. But as C.S. Lewis has put it, all day long we're in some degree helping each other towards immortal horrors or everlasting splendors. He says, it may be possible for each to think too much of his own potential glory hereafter. It is hardly possible for him to think too often or too deeply about that of his neighbor. Now, that, this is daunting, but it's exciting. God's building in his church, and he wants people involved. That includes you and me. Is it on your agenda? Are you getting stuck in? building up and building out? Do you want to disciple others around you? Do you want to reach the lost for Christ? This is God's building project. But how? Well, how do we do it? Well, here in these chapters, God gives us four, four steps, four guidelines, four steps to building. Okay, so step one, we build led by God's foreman. We build led by God's foreman. God's building project is not one where we kind of do our own thing and just kind of hope it fits together. No, God first of all has a man in charge, a construction manager, a site foreman. And here for the tabernacle, it was a man named Bezalel. If you go to chapter 35, verse 30 again. Chapter 35, verse 30. Then Moses said to the people of Israel, See, the Lord has called by name Bezalel, the son of Uri, the son of Hur of the tribe of Judah. And he, was, he has filled him with the Spirit of God, with skill, with intelligence, with knowledge, and with all craftsmanship. He was a man called by name. A man filled with the Spirit of God, set apart to lead the building project. And we know we have a better Bezalel. We have Jesus Christ himself, called by God, spirit-filled, equipped perfectly for the task. We have, perhaps to use the Lego movie's language, we have a master builder. Remember what Jesus said, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. The church exists not because some random guys thought it was a good idea. It doesn't exist because of the IPC's church planting plan or because of human ingenuity. No, God has a home because Jesus Christ is building it. Jesus is creating the perfect home. As he said himself, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word and my father will love him and we will come to him and make our home with him. Isn't that an incredible promise? He's promising he and the Father will come and make their home in us, his people. Jesus is the one shaping us and molding us. He's the one who prepares our hearts, who deals with our sin. And so he's the one who leads us too. He leads us in our apprenticeship. He's the one helping us learn to build, learning to build up and out. We're led by God's foreman. Now this means a few things. It means we listen to him. Doesn't it? As he instructs us, as he gives us an example, as he guides us in the right direction, what do we do? We follow. He's our foreman. And I think it also keeps us from being cowboy builders because we know he's going to come and inspect. Jesus cares about his church. He wants it to be done well. And it also means, encouragingly, we're not building alone. God hasn't sent us off on this worldwide project to do it alone. He's with us. As we struggle, as we find it difficult and hard work, as we make mistakes and need forgiveness, he's there to encourage and correct, to help us, guide us. We build 
led by God's foreman. Step one. Step two, we build obeying God's way. God has a way of building. He's given really good instructions on how to build. For the Israelites, he gave them five chapters specifying exactly the materials, how big things are, how they're to be put together and taken down and carried. It's all there in black and white. And the passage emphasizes to us, we build obeying God's way. If you just go to chapter 39. And just have a look at the way every paragraph ends. Verse one, as the Lord had commanded Moses. Verse five, as the Lord had commanded Moses. Verse seven, as the Lord had commanded Moses. Verse 21, verse 26, verse 29, verse 31. Then verse 32, thus all the work of the tabernacle of the tent of meeting was finished and the people of Israel did according to all that the Lord had commanded Moses. So they did. Now I know some of us are not instructions people and some of us are. Some of us, when we receive an Ikea wardrobe, we just chuck the instructions out the way and go, how hard can this be? Others of us check things exactly against the instructions meticulously. Is this exactly the same place as it is on the picture? It's the same with Lego or something. Some of you just follow the instructions. You have some nice stuff built. Others of you just come to your fore when you have free reign. You've got pieces of car, plane, submarine, space rocket, and pirate ship all put together to make something new and exciting. But when it comes to God's building project, we need to be instructions people. Now, this isn't to stifle our creativity. There's plenty of space for that. But instead, this is to make sure the building is built as beautifully as possible. God is the master architect. He knows exactly what he's doing. I remember hearing of a builder who thought he knew better than the architect. He saw that the architect had set a steel girder of a certain size, and he realized he could get a smaller one but cheaper. And the architect had an absolute panic. That girder was weight-bearing. The whole thing would fall down if it was the wrong size. And that's what it's like with God's building. He's not restricting us. It's because he sees the bigger picture. And so we build obeying God's way. We follow the instructions. Again, just look at Jesus. He came to do what? The Father's will. He willingly offered himself to the Father, even to die. And what instructions did he follow? Well, just think what happened when he was in the desert with the devil. It is written. It is written. It is written. He followed God's word. And the way he built, well, Paul gives us a helpful summary in Ephesians 4, talking about how we should build. Speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way. Isn't that it? Speaking the truth in love. Jesus He was a man of truth, wasn't he? He came to preach. He spoke spoke truth. He rebuked error. He never watered down the gospel. He never shirked the responsibility of correcting the teachers of the day. He built in truth. But he did it in love. He was a man of compassion. He treated people with dignity. He cared for the widow and the outsider. He was gentle and humble. And so as we seek to build up and build out, we do things his way. First and foremost, we we point people to Jesus. We teach his word, not our good ideas. I know an elderly man who just can't help pointing to Jesus. He's a wonderful example. He, He loves being involved in God's building project. He talks to people in the supermarket. He talks to people on the street corner about Jesus. He sends letters and cards pointing people to Jesus. He just reminds you of scripture and God's promises. He builds on Jesus the truth. And like him, like Jesus, we keep scripture central, don't we? As a A kid's camp leader of mine used to always say, the Bible is not just the basis of belief, it's also the means of ministry. It's not just the basis of belief, it's also the means of ministry. We use it, 
We point people to what God says. We point people to Jesus using what God says. That's why, you know, at church we, we preach Bible passages. That's why we, we use the word one to one. We want to read and open the Bible uh, with people. While we study the Bible in our house groups, you know, whether it's discipleship or evangelism, truth matters. That's what the church is built upon. And we do it in love. We speak with kind and gentle words. We love in action too. We share our lives with people. We build obeying God's way. And this means the end never justifies the means. This, this one is so easy to forget and we've seen it time and time again in the church. A workman building what looks like a good building. It's big, it's high, it's shiny. But actually... They've built ignoring God's way. I don't know, rather than gentleness, there's been abuse. Rather than truth, there's been a softening of the gospel and letting the culture dictate things. But both of those end in disaster. We've seen it. This is God's home. He knows how it's built. But just think of what can be done this way. Even today... There must have been billions of conversations going on between Christians God's way, encouraging each other, speaking truth to one another, pointing each other to Christ, building. And that's after millions of sermons preached and Bibles read out, building. And there must be even more kind, loving actions being performed, the gentle word, the time given, the food shared, people are building building God's way, glorious lives of God's apprentices, all reflecting Jesus. God's involving us in the project. We build obeying God's way. So that's step two. Step three, we build trusting it's God's work. We build trusting it's God's work. Now what's strange about this whole building project in Exodus is the way it starts with a command about the Sabbath. Did you notice that? Chapter 35, verses 1 to 3. And actually, this isn't the first time. The instructions about uh, the Sabbath actually ended the previous section outlining how the tabernacle was going to be built. You can see it if you flip back to chapter 31, verses 12 to 17. You can see the heading there, the Sabbath. So the instructions end with the Sabbath, and then the building starts with a comment on the Sabbath. So just before God's people get to work, building God's home, getting involved in God's plan, completing the project Adam was meant to do, just before that, God reminds them, don't work on a Saturday. Don't work on the Sabbath, he said. Just imagine it, the people, excited, the camp buzzing, the noises, the hard work, the sweaty brows and the tired arms. And then Friday night comes, and there's quiet over the camp. But you can imagine people wondering, should I just finish this bit off tomorrow? Should I just get this bit done? It means we're ahead for the next week. Is God's home surely he just wants me to work and work? I could get it done. But God really commands a rest. And he means it. Whoever does any work on it shall be put to death, he says. You must stop and rest. And this pattern of work forms his people into trusting that their work is God's work. We work and then we leave it with God. Because get to that Friday night and God's people had to stop. They knew building him a home required hard work, but it also required stopping. Father, here's what I've done this week. I've stopped now. It's yours. You complete what you want to build in your time. It's your project anyway. We build trusting it's God's work. And actually, we see this throughout Jesus' ministry, don't we? Not only did he keep the Sabbath, but he was a man of prayer, trusting God with the building work he had to do. There's a wonderful moment in the beginning of Mark's gospel when it says this, and rising very early in the morning while it was still dark, Jesus departed and went out to a desolate place and there he prayed. And Simon and those who were with him searched for him and they found him and said, everyone is looking for you. 
Here, Jesus took time to pray. Even when there was kingdom work to do, even when he had preaching and healing and demons to cast out, he still entrusted it all to God. We build trusting it's God's work. This is his building we're involved in. And the Sabbath reminds us of this. It stops us. It stops us being proud and self-reliant. I think so often we can think, if I don't build, then it won't get built. I think this is a temptation for us all, perhaps especially for those in ministry. Perhaps you, you know that temptation to work and work. And perhaps then look down on those doing less than you. And we can become proud at that point. Well, I told this many people about Jesus this week. I really encouraged that person. I stayed up last night reading another theology book, so I'm ready to teach and build others up. Well, we can have the opposite reaction and despair. I just can't keep up. I'm not, I'm not as clever as they are. I can't read like they can. I'm not very good at explaining the gospel like them, and we, we just think it's all down to us. But the Sabbath reminds us this is God's work. So we work, yes, we're God's apprentices, but we pray. And then we go to bed, we stop, we sleep. And we can sleep peacefully knowing this is God's house. He will build it. He will build it as he sees fit. It's under the hand of his foreman. It's empowered by his spirit. And he will bring his good work to completion. So we build, led by God's foreman. We build, obeying God's way. We build, trusting it's God's work. And lastly, and very briefly, step four. We build knowing God's the goal. We build knowing God's the goal. Let's just finish in Exodus 40. If you turn back there. And I'll just read those last few verses again from verse 34. Then the cloud covered the tent of meeting and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle and Moses was not able to enter the tent of meeting because the cloud settled on it and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Throughout all their journeys, whenever the cloud was taken up from over the tabernacle, the people of Israel would set out. But if the cloud was not taken up, then they did not set out till the day it was taken up. For the cloud of the Lord was on the tabernacle by day and fire was in it by night in the sight of all the house of Israel throughout all their journeys. The thing about building is I think we can quickly miss the whole point because we love to do the things of building. We love to chop and saw and cut and stack and mix and sew. Or in ministry terms, we can love to teach and preach and read and speak. We love to give and help and work for others, and that is a lovely thing. But we forget, we're the building. And what's the building? It's God's home. It's his house. It's where he's coming to dwell now and for eternity. God's the goal. This is for his glory to be amongst us, for us to know him, to be with him, to enjoy him and glorify him. That's part of what's going on each and every Sunday. We're recalibrating. We're here to worship. We're here to be with God. That's what it's about first and foremost. God with his people, covenant in covenant together. Yet we can be so set on doing and doing and doing, we can forget what it's all for. May we be, like in the Gospels, like Mary, who at the right time sat at the feet of Jesus rather than being busy working and working like her sister. And what did Jesus say? Mary has chosen the good portion. Yes, let's be builders. God has invited us into the wonderful plan to build his church. We have an amazing opportunity to reach people with the gospel of Christ. We have the privilege of speaking Christ into people's lives, building them up, encouraging them in their difficult and tiring walk on this earth. But in the midst of it all, let's build knowing God's the goal. Let's be worshipers. May our hearts be sold out for God, not just for doing things for him. God's building a home. He's getting us involved. 
And in the end, he is the goal. Amen.